Every culture in the world has tried to demystify it, from the Oracle of Delphi in ancient Greece to the Nichung Oracle in Tibet. We have looked for the ability to speak prophecy and to answer questions about the future. When you think of the word oracle, you might think of neon signs, crystal balls, or images like these from popular culture. But in fact, the word oracle literally means to speak, and oracles were thought to be portals through which the divine could communicate powerful insights to humanity. In the 17th century, one of the oldest and most influential oracles was introduced to the Western world. It was believed to hold the answer to any question you asked of it. It's called the I Ching, or more commonly, the Book of Changes. Well, the thing which amazed me about the I Ching and caused me to become so deeply involved with it is this fact that it seems to work against all rational expectation, the carrying out of this uh, random ritualistic activity seems then to give a reading which is in fact applicable to the unique situation. Well, everybody, every elite used the I Ching, everyone. It's because it was just so illuminating. Again, the, the idea of the mirror of your mind, you know, that, that it, it will allow you to reflect which you're not even aware of. Uh, that's just a very exciting idea. In the television show Mad Men, which was set in the 1960s, Don Draper meets a girl who introduces him to the I Ching. The I Ching isn't just a book filled with ancient Chinese philosophy. It's an oracle used for divination, to look into the future, and to answer questions about our lives. What are you doing? The I Ching. Don, ask a question. You can just think of it. You don't have to say it out loud. Perfect. She tosses the coins, and later in the episode, she approaches Don in his office to give him the results of the I Ching reading, among other things. Does someone love me? What? That's what your question was. Why would you say that? That's everyone's question. It's an odd and surreal scene, and it shows us just how popular and influential the I Ching had become in America by the 1960s. For instance, in November 27, 1965, Bob Dylan gave an interview where he described the I Ching as the only thing that's amazingly true, period. Besides being a great book to believe in, it's also fantastic poetry. In 1966, Allen Ginsberg, a founding father of the Beat Generation of the 1950s, and a major countercultural figure of the 1960s wrote a widely distributed poem called Consulting the E. Jing Smoking Pot, Listening to the Fug Sing Blake. And former Beatles musicians John Lennon and George Harrison were also known to consult the E. Jing. Lennon sang about it in his song God, released in 1970. And Harrison used the E. Jing to help write the lyrics to the song While My Guitar Gently Weeps. In the West, artists and musicians helped push the E. Jing into the spotlight. But what exactly is the I Ching, and where does it come from? The I Ching is considered to be the oldest of the great Chinese classics, emerging as early as 1300 BC. It's made up of 64 symbols that are believed to form the basic categories of everything that exists. And through its spiritual symbolism, it was thought to provide the means by which to understand all phenomena. What this means is that you can ask it any question and it will give you a meaningful answer. And for centuries, that's precisely what people used it for. Each symbol in the I Ching is called a hexagram because it's made of a combination of six lines, and each has its own unique divinatory meaning. A line in a hexagram can either be solid, which represents yang, or it can be a broken line, which represents yin. These lines are formed through a divinatory procedure by separating and counting yarrow sticks, grains of rice, or most commonly, by tossing three coins. The I Ching is based on the idea that everything in the universe is a combination of yin and yang. Yin represents elements of darkness, receptivity, and the negative polarity, and yang represents elements of light, activity, and the positive polarity. Out of these two come everything. We can compare yin and yang with the binary language of ones and zeros used in computer systems. And by using different combinations of ones and zeros, 
we can make every kind of computer program. In fact, the 17th century mathematician Gottfried Leibniz was deeply impressed by how the I Ching had invented a binary number system centuries before he did. And we can also see this binary system in our own bodies and in our nervous system, where, for example, a neuron that carries electrical signals from our nerves to the brain will either fire or not fire. If it fires, it's a yes. And if it doesn't fire, it's a no. When we combine these solid and broken lines into hexagrams, we find that everything we experience is made up of a combination of little yeses and nos. We can see this in the symbol of yin and yang itself, where black and white are opposites, but each implies the other. Each contains its opposite. And conceptually, you can't have one without the other. They're inseparable. The 64 hexagrams are a symbolic language, and each symbol captures an insight that expresses one of the 64 states of change that we find in life and in nature. When you understand that particular state of change, and when you see how it operates in your life, then you can best respond to that situation when it arises. For example, let's say you ask the I Ching a question, and it gives you hexagram 46. This hexagram, called Sheng, refers to the concept of pushing upward. Here, we're given the metaphor of a sprouting seed that pushes through the surface of the soil. The symbolic message is to let small victories build on one another, to bring you closer to your goals, even as opposing forces might try to bury you. The message emphasizes the importance of patience. The author Philip K. Dick, who is also known for consulting the I Ching, was amazed by its accuracy and how it would often seem to answer the hidden question behind the question. He wrote that the I Ching gives advice beyond the particular, advice that transcends the immediate situation. Its answers have a universal quality, and if you use the I Ching long enough and continually enough, it will begin to change and shape you as a person. And while in the West, the I Ching became a symbol of 1960s counterculture, in China, the I Ching was very much mainstream. For thousands of years, it was used by men and women at every level of society, from the social elite to the common person, as a tool to help clarify decisions and to navigate the world around them. A story from the 1780s describes a Manchu military commander named Fu Kang An, who was responsible for leading his army through a war against a group of rebels. As the conflict dragged on, more and more resources were being used up, and he was beginning to doubt whether it was worth it to keep fighting. He sought advice from a man named Luo Shi Jing, who was renowned for his skill with divination. Luo consulted the Yi Jing, which gave him the hexagram 35, also known as Jin. Jin is a message of progress and advancement. It describes a metaphor of a bright light that rises above the earth to illuminate the darkness. It says that if progress is impeded, then persist and you will find your fortune. Hexagram 35 is considered to be a very positive sign. Luo took this message to the military commander and gave him the advice to keep fighting the battle. He followed this advice and eventually succeeded in beating the rebels, winning the war. What's interesting is that Hexagram 35 talks about the nobleman of Kang, which shares an interesting synchronicity because the word Kang also appears in the military commander's name, Fu Kang An. After his victory, he was also given the rank of nobleman from the throne, which is another astonishing synchronicity. One of the most important philosophical ideas to come out of China in the 4th and 3rd centuries was that the main goal of human activity was to harmonize with the natural patterns of change in the universe. For many thinkers of the time, divination was a means to understand the cosmos and one's place within it, and the I Ching had become a powerful tool for achieving exactly this kind of understanding. But in our modern world, which emphasizes logic and reason over intuition and feeling, you might ask, does the I Ching as an oracle for divination really work? And if it does, then how? Let's look at a few theories. The ethnobotanist and author Terence McKenna was so fascinated with the I Ching that he carried out a mathematical analysis to try to explain how and why it was arranged the way it was. He came to the conclusion that the 64 hexagrams were not a random sequence of symbols, but that they were carefully constructed to give the results that they do, and they were an ancient attempt to map the nature of time itself. In an interview, McKenna described how it might work. If what we're saying is that time is fractal, then implicit in that statement is the idea that patterns repeat on many, many levels. Well, that is really what all systems of divination all over the world have always claimed, that in a pool of water, in a flaw in a crystal, 
somehow these objects, these processes become microcosms of the larger situation in the macrocosm. McKenna believed that the idea of history repeating itself implies that there must be patterns that reoccur over and over again in time. Throughout history, we find periods of war followed by periods of peace, times of prosperity followed by famine, and cycles of economic growth followed by recession. If this is true, then understanding one smaller cycle in time could in principle help us understand broader cycles in time. The idea of a structural similarity between the universe, the macrocosm of everything that exists, and human beings, which are a microcosm and a small part within it, has a very ancient history, and it's found in many belief systems worldwide, in ancient Greece, ancient Iran, and in Chinese philosophy. It was believed that uncovering truths about the nature of the cosmos as a whole revealed underlying truths about human nature, and that understanding human nature revealed truths about the cosmos as a whole. This is reflected in the maxim, as above, so below. Each is contained within the other. The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung was also known for his work with the I Ching. Jung actually wrote the foreword to the Richard Wilhelm translation of the I Ching. And in the early 20th century, it was largely due to the efforts of German-speaking thinkers like Jung and Wilhelm, which helped the I Ching gain wider acceptance in the skeptical and rationalist countries of the West. Jung spent a lot of time trying to understand how an ancient book could give such meaningful answers to the questions we ask of it. He linked this to his famous concept of synchronicity. Synchronicities are meaningful coincidences that happen when an inner psychological state of the mind corresponds to an event in the world. They aren't connected by cause and effect, they're connected by meaning. One example of synchronicity is seeing the same name over and over again in seemingly random and unexpected places, only to find that it's the name of a suburb where you finally find your home. Along these same lines, we can think of the I Ching as a synchronicity machine, because by tossing three coins and finding the corresponding hexagram, we purposely make coincidences between our own thoughts and the pages of the book. The falling of the coins, the state of mind of the asker, and the divinatory symbols are all things that fall together in time, and the corresponding answers we get from the I Ching are a symbolic mirror of the present moment. And through this process, we create meaning in a way that helps clarify the present and gives insight into a possible future. Jung was astonished by the fact that such a seemingly random procedure could produce such insightful answers. He argued that meaningful answers are the rule with the I Ching and that it seems to have a remarkable intelligence of its own. But why should this be? Jung believed that our lives are not a series of random events. He saw a deeper and underlying order, which he called Unis Mundus, Latin for one world, in which describes the concept of a unified reality from which everything emerges and to which everything returns. Jung anticipated that skeptics would criticize the I Ching. For example, a skeptic might say that anyone who looks for answers in the I Ching is simply projecting their own psychological thoughts and impressions into the symbolism of the hexagrams. But Jung argued that even if this is true, it does no harm to the function of the I Ching. On the contrary, don't you see how useful it is in making you project your unrealized thoughts onto its pages? This is because being able to project your own thoughts about a problem you're having can help you clarify those thoughts, and it can help you move forward to find new solutions. And we can see the value of this in psychological tools like the Rorschach inkblot tests, where the whole point is to have the subject project their thoughts, desires, and memories onto the inkblot images. In fact, they're called projective tests for exactly that reason. And whatever you happen to believe about the merits of using it as an oracle for divination, the I Ching has been used for centuries in the ancient world as a psychological projective test. What's more, Jung saw the rich symbolism in the 64 hexagrams not just as a way to access our own intuition, but as a doorway that could unlock the power of the unconscious mind and what he called the collective unconscious, which we looked at in this video. According to Jung, the collective unconscious is a universal storehouse of symbols, images, and ancestral memory that are found in every person and in every culture in the world. When we use the I Ching to clarify our thoughts, we're tapping into a vast repository of ancient wisdom that stretches back to the beginning of humankind itself. Jung saw such value in the I Ching as a psychological tool that he used it extensively in his own life and with his own patients. In the end, 
there are many paths available to all of us, and nothing has to compel you to take this particular path. As Jung wrote, the I Ching does not offer itself with proofs and results. It does not vaunt itself, nor is it easy to approach. Like a part of nature, it waits until it's discovered. He who is not pleased by it does not have to use it, and he who is against it is not obliged to find it true. So let it go forth into the world for the benefit of those who can discern its meaning. In the next video, we'll look at how you can use the I Ching to access the wisdom and archetypal symbolism in its pages. Once this video is available, you'll see it appearing here on the left. If it's not yet available, then I think you'll enjoy the video on the right. If you like this video, please show your support by pressing the like button. It helps me to bring more free content like this to you. As always, thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next video.